Well, good morning. It's a delight to see you today. It's a lovely day. Isn't it a great day for the Lord Jesus to come back? Wouldn't that be wonderful? She just sang about it till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. And you know, as I think about heaven, while you're turning to 1 Corinthians 1.18, as I think about heaven, one of the things about this splendid city, this new Jerusalem that's going to descend from God out of heaven, one of the things is, we can't conceive how it is. I know there's at least one street made of gold, probably more than that. But right there in the center of that 1,500 mile cube, right there in the center is a throne. And out of that throne flows a river. And that river is a river of healing. And that river is a place where, boy, I hope fishing's still good. You know what I'm saying? It's one of those places where God is just simply going to bless us. And on either side of the river are trees. And those trees have fruit and those trees, the leaves are for healing of the nations. And there's a fruit, a different fruit every season. Wow! It's going to be splendid. It's possible because of the cross of Jesus. It's possible because of that. Look at the scripture. You don't need to stand this morning. Just look at the scripture. Say it with me if you need it. It's there on the screen for you. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word message there in your King James says preaching of the cross. Contextually, that's the more appropriate uh, application of the word. The word is logos. Um, the message literally is word, W-O-R-D in English, logos. And contextually, it is about the preaching of the cross. We preach Christ and him crucified, Paul said. And that's what this is about, the preaching of the cross. And I want us to go to the cross today. I want to tell you about it. Now, let me tell you a story about Adrian Rogers, what he, what he said one time, one of his stories. Off the coast of South China, some pilgrims and harbor settlers once built this massive cathedral and after some time this typhoon came through and destroyed that cathedral. Only the front wall of the cathedral was left standing. There on that front wall was a great bronze cross. Sometime before 1825, John Bowring, an accomplished politician from England who wrote and spoke dozens and dozens of languages, was shipwrecked off that coast and despaired for his life. He's on a piece of driftwood from the ship and as he approaches the ruins of that building silhouetted against the sky he saw that bronze cross and that cross spoke to him of safety and it spoke to him of security because he knew that he was reaching the shore. So, during that time, as he thought of this, he wrote these words, In the cross of Christ I glory, towering over the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. Paul tells us in Galatians 6, 14, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
And this morning, I want to show you four clear reasons why you want to glory in the cross, why you want to be part of those who give praise to God for the cross of Jesus Christ. Let me begin with the power of the cross. And let me start there. You see, the Bible says this, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It is the power of God. You see, there's the power of the cross. God purchase your salvation. Here's the most marvelous, the best, the most wonderful news that I can possibly share with you. Your salvation is freely given if you will but receive it. But it wasn't free. God chose a price. And God chose to pay the price for your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, he offered himself as a sacrifice for sin. And through the horror of the Roman cross, Jesus paid it all. And while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for our sin. And there at Calvary, probably outside the original Damascus gate to the northern part of the city, according to some scholars, Jesus was nailed to that wood. Alfred Edersheim wrote in his commentary on this, in the life and times of Jesus the Messiah, they took long nails Spikes, if you will. Now think of it. They're made from the very earth that he spoke into existence. And they nailed him down. First his right hand. Then his left hand. And then according to Edersheim, they would raise that cross and place that cross into the ground and grab hold of his feet and nail them into place. Through the cross, God purchased our salvation. Through the cross, God publicly displayed the devil's humiliation. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, the word of God tells us this about what happened at the cross, on the cross, in that moment, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. There on the cross, there God took the power of Satan, that power that's been over us since Adam. And the power has been defeated. No longer are there chains of sin wrapped around your ankles and your wrists, forcing you to go where you don't want to go and do what you do not want to do. There is nothing hanging over you now that requires you to obey the sin nature before you knew Christ Jesus. There you were a slave to that sin nature. You were a slave and you were forced to walk the death walk, the death march according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the course of this world. You were a slave. But Satan's power ladies and gentlemen, has been defeated through the cross of Jesus Christ. In the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan's position of authority will be destroyed. Now hear me, legally his position is already destroyed. But in terms of time, and the reality of the world in which we live, understand that the day is still coming 
when Satan will finally be forever cast down and forever placed into the lake of fire. He has a short time left. There is until the, the time of the rapture of the church and the tribulation that he will wreak havoc in the world during that during that millennial kingdom that's mentioned in the book of Revelation in the 20th chapter, during that time he will be placed into a pit and he will be held in that pit for a thousand years. And for a thousand years, the presence and the power of Satan will not be known on this planet called Earth. At the end of that thousand years, he will be loosed for a short season. And when he's loosed for that short season, the Bible teaches us and tells us in that moment of time that he will be released and he will come out once again to attempt to deceive the nations. Now understand this. It's incomprehensible for me. It may work for some of you. You may understand it very well. But men and women who have been able to walk up and shake Jesus' hand. Men and women who have seen him face to face during that thousand year period, but who have never faced temptation as you face temptation. Not in that sense. They will be tempted and some of them will actually follow that old scoundrel. They'll follow him and there'll be one last battle. And you know what? He's gonna lose again. He loses every time. But yet he's going to try one more time and he's going to lose yet again. And then he'll be cast forever and ever into that lake of fire that burns with uh, uh, sulfur and, and brimstone. That horrible, horrible place. His authority has been destroyed. In the cross, Satan's permission to have a place in your life has been taken away. This is why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27, do not give place to the devil because he no longer has permission to be in your place. He no longer has permission to be in there in your life. It's been taken away. May I ask you a question? Please answer me honestly. Would you rent a room of your house to a scoundrel, to a thief, or to a liar, or to a robber, or to a murderer? Would you do it? Would you dare do it? Would you take a room of your house? Would you set up on the back part of your lot a mother-in-law suite, except a Satan-in-law suite, and let him sit back there on the back part of your property? Would you do it? Of course you wouldn't do it. Then why would we possibly want to rent one space of our heart to that old serpent, that dragon, that enemy of God called Satan? Why on earth would we do that? He has no authority to be there. He can only be there now by your express permission that's the only way he can be there and if he's bothering you you let him in my the power of the cross and what it's broken oh let me hurry and tell you about the peace through the cross the Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20 that the Lord God made peace made peace through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the word. And by him, by Jesus, he reconciled all things to himself. By him, whether things in, on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. What a savior. We were enemies of God. Friendship with the world, ladies and gentlemen, means you're fighting against God. You're at war with God. And you say, well, I don't, I'm not friends with the world. I just made peace, you know. Peace with the world means you're positioned against God. There is no such thing as neutrality when it comes to God and the world. 
No man can serve two masters. No one can. There is no laissez-faire when it comes to God in the world. It's not there. It's not for you. You can't have it. You're either an enemy of God or you're a friend of God. An alliance with the world is an alliance against God. We were enemies, but we were also excluded from the promises of God. I can't tell you how many promises there are in the Bible that will apply to us. There are more books written about that than you can shake a stick at. You could fill up a, an entire shelf on a library about the promises of God. All the people that's written books. Ten promises, a hundred promises, a thousand promises. They tell you over and over how many promises of God there are. I don't know how many apply to us. I've never sat down and, and uh, counted that. I just know when I find them, it's dear and precious. Amen. I do know this. Until you know Jesus Christ, there are only certain promises that you can claim. And those are the promises that, you, that tell you about being saved. John 3.16 is a promise for you. If you don't yet know the Lord, uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Romans 10.13 is your promise. If you don't yet know the Lord, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 16.31 shall be yours is a promise. You know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved in your house. Those are your promises. Because until you come to the cross and until you meet the Lord at the cross, no other promise is yours except the promise to be saved. The only thing you are waiting for at that time is the executioner's arrival. John 3.18 tells us that he that believes not is condemned already, but he who believes is not condemned. Romans 6.23 says, as you well know, the wages of sin is death. Every person born into this world is stained, indelibly marked by Adam's sin. We have his nature. And we are all one heartbeat away from eternity. Now it's either eternity with God through Christ or it's eternity in hell prepared for the devil and his angels. Old death waits over on one side, wondering if you're going to be the one that he'll be called to take today. But when you turn and you believe on the Lord Jesus, you now have peace with God. You have no reason then to fear old death. He can't hurt you. He can't hold you. He may touch you and bring to you that, that power that he has called death. But the angels of God will take the believer and escort that believer right into the presence of Almighty God. We're only waiting the executioner's arrival until we know the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's also a perfecting work of the cross. And the Bible tells us again in Colossians chapter 2, this time in verse 14, the word of God says this to us about what Jesus did on the cross. Having wiped out, this is what Jesus did at the cross. He wiped out the, the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. What a mysterious verse. What has he done for us? The Bible 
Bible teaches us, ladies and gentlemen, the saving work on the cross. The Bible teaches us that just as Moses lifted up the serpent and in the wilderness and those who looked at it were healed, the Son of Man must be lifted up as well. And those who look to the Son of Man, to the Lord Jesus, will be saved. Colossians, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18 says that the cross is the power of God to those who are being saved. That's a more literal rendering of the passage of Scripture. You see, here's how it's written. Here's how we need to understand. You know this already. Just a simple reminder. You were saved at a point in time. If you've repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you were saved, weren't you, Lane? I mean, that's the truth of the Word of God. You are saved, present tense right now, and then comes the day that you will be saved. This old body that gives you so much trouble. This old body that when I woke up this morning, Dale, it said, what do you think you're doing? Why do you think you're getting out of that horizontal position into a vertical? I don't want you doing this kind of thing. Y'all know what I'm talking about. If you don't yet know what I'm talking about, trust me, it's on its way. It will come and you'll know about it you'll discover muscles you didn't know existed in your body. You will find out just exactly how many joints you have and how many bones you have. But more than that, this old sin nature is going to be squashed once and for all. And you won't have to fuss with the power of sin anymore. Not when the Lord Jesus comes. Not in that moment. That's the saving work on the cross. But the cross does more than that. Because there is a sanctifying work on the cross. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And there you go in your present tense there. I live. It means I keep on living. I'm still living. And I'm just going forward with living. It's a continuous present tense kind of thing that it tells us. That is a picture of the sanctifying work of God on the cross. Philippians 1.6 tells us that he who began a good work in us will accomplish it until his day, until the day of his return, as a matter of fact. That's what he's in the process of doing right now. It's called sanctification. It's called making you look more like Jesus every single day that goes by. You ought to look a little more Christ-like this year than you did last year, ladies and gentlemen. You ought to look a little more Christ-like this year than you did five years ago. If you were looking the other, there's a problem. That's why we're praying for revival, if that's you. If you're looking the other way, if you're looking less Christ-like and talking less Christ-like and living less Christ-like, then ladies and gentlemen, this is why we're praying for revival. This is why we've invited Kenny Digby and Slater Murphy to our church at the end of this month. This is why I have urged you day after day and, and time after time to take that devotional guide that we gave you and sent out to some of you in the mail and said, please read this and be of one mind together in the church so that we can be more Christ-like today than we were yesterday, than we were a year ago. It's the sanctifying work. Oh, let me tell you something. He also, there's a satisfying work on the cross. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 11, that he'll look upon the travail of his soul and be satisfied. What a powerful statement that we need to understand that it wasn't just the travail of his flesh being nailed to the cross. That's where we kind of focus our eyes. That's why movies like The Passion sold and, and, and were shown so many times because you saw the travail of his flesh. But ladies and gentlemen, God saw the travail of his soul and God saw the price of sin yours mine 
and he writhed in anguish. Because you. Does it move you? God, have mercy on you. If you're unmoved by what Jesus did, if you can't weep for the cross, your heart is stone. Jesus, death on the cross is the absolute only way that the wrath of God, the justice of God, the righteousness of God, and the holiness of God could possibly be satisfied. And he looked on the travail of his soul and he was satisfied. The Bible also teaches the separating work of the cross. Before you come to Jesus, your sins have separated you from God. But when you repent and believe the gospel, God separates your sins from you and nails them to the cross. Before you come to Jesus, you have a sin debt written out by your own hand. Every time you sin, you register your guilt before God. Every time you sin, you demonstrate the power of the commandments of God. No idols, do not take the Lord's name in vain, no lust, no adultery, no murder, no false witness. Every time we demonstrate it and God took the handwriting of those ordinances and he nailed it to the cross, the right hand and the left hand and the feet. And he nailed it to the cross. And he abolishes the handwriting against you. The word is autograph. You know what an autograph is? It's your own signature. We were in a meeting, Lim, Lima, Pam, at Agua Viva downtown. You remember? And the singing churchmen were there. Came back out to the bus. Now we had more than one bus and Pam got on one with one group. I was surrounded by members of the church holding out their autograph books and their Bibles. Please sign this. I didn't realize that people are out. The, the singing churchmen were on the bus taking pictures of me signing autographs. And something, a lot of them didn't know who I was. They're saying, who is this guy? Everybody wants his autograph. Every time you sin, you autograph. You're writing it out yourself. It's your own hand. And so if you don't come to Christ, when you get to heaven and God opens the books, he says, is this your writing? Carolyn, is this your writing? I know you know the Lord, so I'm using you, okay? Well, I don't know. I only know if I know the Lord or not, but your testimony says you know the Lord, okay? That's what I'm going by. Carolyn, is this your writing? Is this yours? Well, it looks like it. Yeah, it's your right. Let me show you when you wrote this. Let me show you when you did this. But at the cross, he wipes it out. He abolishes it. I 
have one more truth. The preaching of the cross is to them who perish foolishness. Here it is. I hope this moves you. I hope it moves you to tell someone else because if you're born again, one of the reasons you hear messages like this is to go out, you're, to be encouraged to go tell someone else the truth of God's Word. It's not just for you to sit on, it's for you to share with others as well. You'll perish without the cross. You will. You cannot be saved by your wisdom. That's one of the things that the Greeks believed, that their wisdom was, was, uh, uh, had saving power to it. You cannot be saved by your ways. Not a single person in here is good enough to be saved. You're just not there. It doesn't happen. The very best of us falls short of the glory of God. And I know some of you are a better person than I will ever be when it comes to human goodness. But it's never good enough. Never, 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 never good enough. You cannot be saved by your words. There are people who tell me, well sure, back there when I was 10 years old, I prayed this prayer and therefore God saved me back there. Uh, excuse me while I get me another beer out of the refrigerator, would you mind preacher? And they saved me back then and they live for the devil today claiming some words that they spoke back there. One person that I won't call by name because you might accidentally know who it was said, well, I filled out a card and I prayed this prayer. If that's you, ladies and gentlemen, you need to repent today. Because there's a prayer from the lips and a prayer from the heart. There's a world of difference. And you cannot be saved by your works. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, we preached in your name. We did miracles in your name, Lord. We did mighty works in your name, Lord. And I will say, depart from me. I never, no, in no way ever knew you. You must come to the cross. You must come to the Savior who died on the cross. You must come to the Savior whom God raised from the dead who died on the cross. You must come to the Savior whose name is Jesus. It's the power of the cross demonstrated by the resurrection. And you must call on his name. And you must exercise your will and receive him into your life. You must in order to be born again. Father, the truth of your word impacts and it works on my heart today as I listen to the very words that you taught me during this week and through the years. God, I want to pray now. I want to pray, beloved Father, because the truth of the matter is you're at work in our midst and we, Father, need that. Thank you, beloved. Thank you, Lord, for hearing. Speak to us now. This invitation is for you. If you need a fresh encounter with the Lord, please use these steps as a place of prayer. If you've never come to the Lord Jesus and never trusted Christ, this is your time. You say, well, I don't know what you mean by that. Then come tell Brother David or come tell me and we'll show you in the Word of God what we're speaking about. We'll do that. We'll show you what God says in His Word. Father, bless us during this time. We ask you in Jesus' name.